This is Christopher Cernike, hosting episode 18 of season 2 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins issue and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today we have the honor of hosting Dr. Raymond Demadian. Dr. Demadian studied violin at the Juilliard School of Music, earned a Ford Foundation scholarship at the age of 15, completed a mathematics degree from the University of Wisconsin, a medical degree at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, did biophysics graduate work at Harvard University and was a professor at the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. In the year 2001, the Lemison MIT program bestowed its Lifetime Achievement Award on Dr. Demadian as the man who invented the MRI scanner. Dr. Dermadian has published in peer-reviewed scientific literature, including a highly cited cover article on MRI in the high-profile journal Science. In the book, They Made America, From the Steam Engine to the Search Engine, Two Centuries of Innovators, Dr. Dermadian is listed as the father of the MRI. The MRI technology is widely recognized as one of the greatest medical breakthroughs of the 20th century and has saved and enhanced countless lives. The MRI technology is widely recognized as one of the great medical breakthroughs of the 20th century and has saved and enhanced countless lives. In fact, well over a billion MRI scans have been completed since its invention, with over 60 million additional scans each year. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan awarded the National Medal of Technology to Dr. Demadian, and the following year, Dr. Demadian was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. In March 2004, he was awarded the Franklin Institute Medal for his development and commercialization of MRI which has transformed the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Dr. Dermadian has also earned the United States National Medal of Technology, is the chairman for the Fonar Corporation, and was a scientist featured in the famous 2014 Creation vs. Evolution debate, Is Creation a Viable Model of Origins? Finally, the first MRI scanner ever built, Dr. Dermadian's own machine called Indomitable, was placed in the Smithsonian Institution, a concrete artifact of Dr. Demadian's influence. This interview will be broken up into three segments. The first section will explore the life of Dr. Demadian. The second will deal with the origins, functions, and legacy of the MRI. And the final section will deal with contributions to science by young Earth creationists. Now, without further ado... Good morning, Dr. Manian. How was your day, and how are you doing? Good morning, Chris. Pleased to be with you. It's a pleasure and absolute honor to have you, Dr. Demadian. Actually, you're mentioned in an article called A Renowned Creation Scientist, Inventor of MRI. And you're quoted as saying, For me, my greatest single discovery in life was not a machine or physical principle. My highest purpose was realized when I discovered I could actually know God and serve His will, that I could live for something greater than science, medicine, or myself. Dr. Demadian, on that note, how did you become a born-again Christian? I, I grew up in a Christian family, but the, uh, the big step was uh, that went forward. Uh, is when I went to the Billy Graham crusade in the Madison Square Garden and I went forward and accepted Christ. Amen. That sounds beautiful. That must have been quite a beautiful experience. It was the, the moment of the ingestion 
of the Holy Spirit that has been guiding my life ever since. It's not Dr. Demadian who gave us the MRI. It's the good Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. Actually, in Dr. Jerry Bergman's biographical article about you, he described you as one of many scientists who realize science does not lead to Darwinism. Rather, science leads us to the feet of the grand designer. Dr. Dermadian, from Bergman's description, it's clear that you hold the Bible in highest esteem. I'm curious, what are your favorite books, passages, or verses in the Bible? Well, I, I think I would respond uh, uh, to that, Chris, by, as a scientist, uh, my favorite verse is uh, Colossians 2, 3, and Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And of course, as a scientist, you're always looking for new knowledge and new wisdom, and there's an explicit source, Jesus. So if you're a scientist and you want new knowledge and new wisdom and you want to be uh, productive in that, there's a, there's a simple way to get there. It, just ask Jesus. He'll get you there. Amen. So, Dr. Demadian, since this is Current Topics in Science, we'll quickly look at this week's current topic. In an article from the Omaha World Herald called Revolutionary Inventions from the Year You Were Born, we find you and the MRI listed in the year 1972. The description says, Raymond Demadian, 1972, filed for a patent for his MRI machine. MRI machines can create three-dimensional images of the area being scanned. Tests are used in animals and humans and can identify diseases in the body and even measure thought activity in the brain. Dr. Demadian, what first got you interested in scientific research, and how much does science mean to you? Well, I think the intriguing aspect of science is that it, it gives you the thrill and fascination of the power of discovering new knowledge that never existed before. And um, from a scientist's perspective, that's uh, a very thrilling, is the prospect by using scientific capability of being the discoverer of new knowledge for the benefit of a mankind. It's, it's hard to beat that. If you uh, are gratefully successful in um, coming upon that new knowledge. Amen. Actually, on that note, Dr. Demadian will transition to the second section of the interview concerning your invention, the MRI machine. In Dr. Jonathan Sarfati's article, Dr. Demadian's Vital Contributions to MRI, Nobel Prize Controversy Returns, he writes, Without Demadian's discovery, it could not be known that serious diseases like cancer could be detected by an NMR scanner or that tissue NMR signals possessed sufficient contrast to create medically useful images. Dr. Demadian, how does the MRI help save lives? The thing to recognize is that the unique and special contribution of the MRI that's different from all other medical technologies is its revolutionary power to see the vital organs of the body. And let me be more specific when I say that. The vital organs of the body are all soft tissue, the brain, the heart, the kidney, the liver, the spleen. And medical, tech, med medical imaging technology prior to the advent of the MRI couldn't see those soft tissues. Now, more specifically, in, in the details that we're talking about, an average image is made up of what we call picture elements, pixels. And the average image is a 256 by 256, and it's got a, a typical image has 65,536 of these picture elements, 65,000 pixels. Now, when you go ahead and look at each of those pixels, if they all have the same brightness, your medical image is a blank. So the ability to see detail 
in the critical organs of your body, the soft tissues that I mentioned before, is your ability to visualize contrast between the pixels. If all the pixels have the same brightness, your image is a blank. Now, what was, medi what was confounding medicine prior to the advent of the MRI is that if you measured the maximum contrast you could picture in these detailed generating picture elements or pixels, the maximum contrast you could generate by X-ray technology was 4%. And so the general, the, the general consequence of medical image prior to the MRI, you couldn't see the tissues you really needed to see because they were the ones that were responsible for life and death. And fortunately, when we made the discovery the pixel contrast that we could achieve with an MRI was not 4%, but 131%. And all of a sudden, we're able to see in endless detail all of the vital organs that we could never see before, the soft tissues of the body. And that's, had, that's just had revolutionary consequences. I mean, you can look at those tissues, for example, and let's say you have a tumor. You can be looking at that tumor and when the patient is being treated, you can look in that tumor and say, is the tumor responding to the uh, therapy or is it not responding to therapy? Do I, should I change the drug? Should I change the dose? Should I go do something different than drugs? All of a sudden, you have this new power because you can see in detail the vital organs that you could never see before. That's, that's what MRI produced. And I'll, I'll summarize that by saying what the MRI delivered that was never available before was pixel contrast. And uh, it's another uh, beauty about it too, by the way, unlike x-ray, uh, it's safe. Uh, there's no ionizing radiation. So just if I could just exaggerate it, you could do an MRI scan every hour and have no adverse impact on the patient, which you, you couldn't come anywhere near doing uh, with x-ray. And you'd have to put it on x-ray if you wanted to repeat it with a CAT scan or an x-ray, You'd have to delay uh, the the visits and the and the, and the imagery production. You'd have to put them weeks apart because you you couldn't be exposing your patient to that ionizing radiation. But that 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 problem is non-existent, gratefully, with the MRI. That's pretty incredible. And actually, speaking of the MRI invention, on page one hundred and sixty-five of the Kindle edition of the book Gifted Mind, you're quoted as saying. I attribute the invention of the MRI entirely to the Lord's hand in revealing it to me. I credit his specific intervention to accomplish its reduction to practice. Dr. DeMaiden, may you please tell us more what inspired you to create the MRI machine? Well, <clears throat> there are uh, different aspects of that, but one of the ways that I got started in that uh, was in my scientific work, I, I was focused on the profound phenomenon of the electricity of life. So everyone that we're talking to today is himself a con ed plant, and he's generating his own electricity as he needs it. And when that Con Ed plant shuts down at the end, his, his electricity shuts off. So this phenomenon that each living human being is his own Con Ed plant is, was astounding to me. And so I, that's where I started. You know, how does the living cell generate its own voltage so it can carry on its electricity? And as I studied that, I there was an existing theory that explained the, the, the fundamental element that's generating electricity. To be more specific, the electricity of the living cell is arising from two atoms, the potassium atom and the sodium atom. And each of them have a unique characteristic. They're not neutral atoms. They each have a one plus charge. So they are ions. And when people investigated where the electricity of life came from, they recognized that there was 140 millimoles per liter potassium ion inside the cell, and there was four millimoles per liter 
on the outside of the cell. And you put those two numbers in a standard battery equation, you got the voltage that you measured on the inside of the cell. So that made it very clear that the voltage of electricity of life was coming from this gradation of the potassium ion, the potassium atom. So the next question that the scientific community had to address was why the potassium ion inside the cell when everything else on the, in the rest of the tissue is surrounded by the one plus charge sodium ion? Why potassium and not sodium? Why do, how does a cell pick potassium and not sodium? And the standard explanation at the time was that there was situated on the surface of the cell a protein, which they named the sodium pump. And that protein pumped the potassium ion in and pumped the sodium out. So I started off my research and I, some of the professors that I was dealing with, I asked them, I said, has anybody ever isolated this sodium pump? And the amusing answer I got from that, well, no, the guy who does that's going to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so uh, the, <laughs> the pump had never been isolated. And the professor I was talking about, it said, well, uh, if you're interested in doing that, Damadian, uh, I have a suggestion that you could do it. Do your research on bacteria. Because what you could do with the bacteria is you could make a mutant of the bacteria that can't do it. And then you'll have two cells. You'll have the parent cell that can do it. You'll have the mutant that can't do it. And then if you fractionate the proteins, when you find the protein that doesn't match up, that's your pump. So I said, well, yeah, the only thing is it's, it, it's such a fundamental of life. How do I know I'm going to make the, get the bacteria to live long enough so I can secure a mutant bacteria that can do this? And the answer I got was, that's your problem, man. Anyway, I went ahead and did my research. And luckily, I did find a mutant of the E. coli bacteria. I did isolate a mutant of the E. coli bacteria that couldn't do it. Uh, as compared to the parent. And then I started fractionating the proteins. And I, when I fractionated the proteins, it went on for uh, months to years, I couldn't find a protein that didn't match up. And so after doing this for a number of months, I said, well, you know, maybe you should go to the scientific literature and see what's the evidence for this pump. Because if the evidence is not solid, you'll be searching for it for the rest of your life. Maybe. So I went to the literature search for the evidence that this pump was real. And the first thing I ran into was in the monograph by a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Gilbert Ning Ling, 500 pages, in which he went into great detail that the pump was fiction, that there was no pump. And what he said was that the way this voltage and everything comes about is the potassium atom is a one plus charge. And it accumulates on the inside of this living cell because it's sticking to the negative charges of the living cell. The carboxylates and nucleic acids, and that's how come the potassium is accumulating. <clears throat> so the next question, if that really was the right answer, why is potassium accumulating and not sodium? And I started looking into that. And the first thing I found out was that the commercial chemists, the Dow Chemistry and other places, made ion exchange resin beads that accumulated potassium and excluded sodium. So I said, well, let me see, what, let me see their explanation, because they don't have, uh, on these ion exchange beads, they don't have a pump to help them. So uh, let me see how they explain it. And their explanation was fairly straightforward, that the sodium ion, which is one plus charge, is smaller in dimension than the potassium ion, which is larger. But they both have a one plus charge. So the charge per square centimeter, the volts per square centimeter of the sodium ion is greater than the volts per square centimeter of the potassium ion. And none of these, in, in, the, in, in our natural world, none of these ions live naked. They all contain an atmosphere of the dipole water molecule H2O around them. And what the Dow chemical chemists 
explained as the reason their ion exchange beads picked potassium and not sodium was that the fully hydrated sodium ion was much larger than the fully hydrated potassium ion because the sodium ion had a higher charge density and it attracted more molecules. So the net answer from their perspective was it was accumulating the potassium because it took up less space. And the fully hydrated potassium ion was smaller than the fully hydrated sodium ion, and that explained the accumulation. So I thought that that was a good answer, and I proceeded to uh, develop that general idea. And as I proceeded along this pathway um, and came to the conclusion that the cell was accumulating the potassium ion and it wasn't by pumping. I got a phone call from a professor of chemistry, Freeman Thorndike Cope, whose ancestor wrote the, uh, uh, the Thorndike Dictionary. And he called me up and said, Damien, I've been reading your papers. How'd you like to prove what you're saying? I said, what are you talking about, Cope? He said, well, we, can ha we have access to a new technology called NM." Are nuclear magnetic resonance. And I'll just point out to uh, anybody that's hearing today that MRI is a synonym of NMR. And the way it went from NMR to MRI is when we started and introduced it to the scientific community, they wanted to get rid of the, uh, the, the medical people wanted to get rid of the N because that implied nuclear and radioactivity, which didn't exist. And the radiologists wanted to add I, uh, which was imaging, so NMR became MRI. But the unique feature of the NMR te MRI technology is that, and it's really uh, you know, almost astounding, um, the unique aspect of the NMR MRI technology is that the atoms generate radio waves. So you put a radio wave into the atom and the atom answers back with its own radio signal. And what we do is we harvest those radio signals and we use them to make pictures. And the reason we do that is those radio signals are very differentiating of the chemistry of that particular molecule and what's going on in the life of that molecule. So, um, Cope said, we can use this new technology, NMR technology, and we can measure the decay time of the potassium atom. And if it's what you say, uh, that the potassium is accumulating by sticking to negative charges on the inside of the cell. When we measure the decay time of that signal, of the potassium signal, it should be much shorter because the potassium atom is bound to the negative charges on the inside of the cell. And he said, uh, I said, well, how are we going to do this? He said, well, I, got, I know a new company on the outskirts of uh, Pittsburgh in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, that makes this new kind of NMR machine. And it, I, I had to stop and pause and point out that there are two kinds of NMR machines. There's an NMR machine that when it gets a signal, it <clears throat> determines the chemical spectra of, of the sample. And that's called spectral NMR, spectrum NMR. And the one that Cope was talking about was um, pulsed NMR, which didn't look at the chemical spectra of the signal, but looked at the signal and determined how long the signal lasted. What was the decay time of the signal? So Cope said, listen, uh, made, and he said, if you're right that the potassium is accumulating on the inside of the cell by sticking to negative charges, it should have a shorter decay time. And we can go to this company on the outskirts of Pittsburgh and we can run the samples and measure the decay time. So we went together. And I grew up bacteria that I got from the Dead Sea, Halobacter holobium. I put them in a test tube, gave them to Cope. Cope put them inside this NMR magnet, which had an opening of two and a half inches put the test tube in there, and sure enough, you got a, a marked shortening in the decay time of the potassium signal compared to potassium in liquid solution. But when I gave it to him, um, and he had a, 
he was an MD and, and, and he had a, a, a specialty background in physics. I said, Cope, I can't believe what, what you did. He said, what are you talking about, man? I said, I gave you a test tube. You put it in this machine without going into the sample or obeying anything. You just put an antenna around the outside of the machine, or around the outside of the tube. You got the signal and you measured the potassium. I said, I can't believe you did that. He said, what are you talking about, man? I said, well, when I measure potassium, it takes me several days or, in order to do the chemical analysis of the tissue, uh, in order to do the chemical analysis of the sample. And you did it in a matter of milliseconds. And you didn't even invade the sample. You just took an antenna and you did the chemical analysis completely non-invasively. I said, Cope, do you realize if we ever could do something like that on a human body, you could go from one tissue to the next and get his chemistry without invading it. Well, he thought that was off the wall. Uh, and so I thought, you know, I'd be nice to do that. And I spoke to the president of this small company called NMR Special. His name was Paul Yaiko. I said, Paul, I have this idea. Uh, I'd like to look at this signal coming from the tissue in the NMR. Can I go back to my university laboratory and grow up some um, animals with cancers in them and remove the cancer tissue and bring it back and put it in your machine? Because my expectation is that the decay time of that signal of the cancer tissue is going to be different than the decay time of healthy tissue. Can I come back to do that? And he said, sure. So I grew up uh, the rats that had the cancer tissue. I went, I, I removed the cancer tissue, put them in a test tube, and put the normal tissue in a test tube. And remarkably, the decay time of the signal of a cancer tissue was dramatically different than the decay time of the signal of healthy tissue. The, the, the decay time of the cancer tissue uh, was 800, 900 milliseconds. The decay time of the healthy tissue was 200 milliseconds, 200 plus milliseconds. So I said, wow. I said, uh, it, it might be possible to go and build and, and take this magnet, which has only got an opening of two and a quarter inches, and make it big enough to put, instead of a test tube, put a human body in that. Well, when I sat down and did the calculations, I uh, ran into another curious difficulty. Uh, I calculated that the amount of wire I was going to have, going to need, in order to build this big magnet, was 30 miles of wire. So 150,000 feet. So I said, when I when I computed. Uh, the amount of money it was it was going to cost. Um, <clears throat> it was one hundred fifty thousand dollars that I was going to have to come up with to buy the wire to build this human magnet. And I didn't know how I was going to go about that. So I I called the the sales engineer that I had been working with from Westinghouse, and <clears throat> I said, Steve Lane was his name. I said, Steve. I said, I'm. Another important detail, when this wire, when you bought it from Westinghouse, it didn't all come on one spool. It came on a series of eight or 10 spools. And in order to build my magnet, I was going to have to make, oh, and, and the unique aspect of this wire was it was super conducting, meaning that if I took that wire and put it into liquid helium, cooled it down to liquid helium temperature, it will conduct, it would conduct the electricity with zero electrical resistance. So I could put thousands of amperes into it in order to make a powerful enough magnet to do a human being. But when I looked into the price, it was uh, completely beyond my reach. It was 150,000, I only had 15,000. So I said, well, in the meantime, until I figure out how to come up with the money to do this, um, I'm going to have to make joints between successive lengths of this superconducting niobium titanium wire, and I'm going to have to learn how to make the joints. So I called Steve Lane at Westinghouse. I said, Steve, I said, can you teach me how to make these joints? And I hadn't told him anything about what my aspects were and trying to imagine and all that. He said, wait, wait a minute. What are you doing, the maiden? Are you going into con competition with Westinghouse? I said, no, 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 Steve. I said, I'm trying to build a, I've got this idea where I want to try to build a magnet big enough to put a human in so, so I can do an NMR scanning of the human body. Oh, 
says, well, it's good you're level with me, Demet. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about, Steve? He said, well, I can share something with you uh, that nobody knows at the moment. Westinghouse is going out of the business of making superconducting magnets. And I have about 30 miles of wire in my warehouse that I can let you have for 10 cents on the dollar. After making it, Westinghouse, after making it for 23 years, the, the moment that I need it, they go out of business and I can get it at 10 cents a dollar. I, I couldn't believe this. So anyway, you said, when do you want it? I said, how about tomorrow? I'll come out with my graduate students to do it. So I was astounded by the fact that they had been making this wire for 23 years and the instant I need it, they're going out of business and they go, let me have it on 10 cents. How do you explain that one? I was telling that to my mother-in-law, and, uh, so, uh, who were both mother-in-law and father-in-law, both evangelical Christians. I said, it was an astounding coincidence. They're, they're, they're going out of business. They go, let me have $0.10 cents a dollar. It's, a, uh, it's an amazing coincidence. My mother-in-law said, it's not a coincidence. Right? I said, what are you talking about, Mom? She said, ever since your father and I learned of what you were trying to do to build this first scanner, we've been praying for the success of that result. This is not a coincidence, Raymond. This is an answer to prayer. So we went out and uh, uh, naturally uh, uh, there was no other explanation. Uh, uh, so we went out and got the wire and we built the first human magnet that instead of or the diameter of the magnet coil, instead of being two and a half inches, it was 20 inches so that we could put a uh, human being human body. And then there was another problem we had built and put a human being into it, uh, into this coil we had built. And so it was finally decided by some manner of consensus that the individual who most deserved this glorious opportunity was the silly fool who thought it up. So um, I was the one that everybody agreed should be the one to get into the magnet. So I got into the magnet, I had the antenna wrapped around me, Minkoff, uh, were helping me do this and had the audacity to suggest why it had, why we couldn't get an NMR signal from Dr. Demadian's body. Goldsmith said, my graduate student, Dr. Goldsmith, who, as I said, weighed 250 pounds, had the audacity to suggest that the reason we didn't get a signal from Demadian's anatomy was that he was too fat for Goldsmith's coil. And what he was doing, he was loading the impedance of the coil. Well, that became the Goldsmith two fat hypothesis. And there was only one way to test it, to get a skinnier sample. Well, we had one. Larry Minkoff was my other graduate student. He was skinny, but he wouldn't get in there. Finally, after two weeks of encouragement from Dr. Demadian and Dr. Goldsmith, Larry says, all right, all right. I'll get in just to see if we get a signal. And by the time he got in, it was midnight of July 3rd, 1977. And we put him in and I had a focus spot, which I located to focus this image, which I put, I located the focus spot in directly in the center of Larry's heart. And that focus spot would be what would produce a signal. And I situated that focus spot in the center of Larry's heart where there was plenty of water and plenty of hydrogen to produce the signal. And that's where we had flunked on me. So we put him in there. I put the focus spot in the center of Larry's heart and miraculously we got a signal. I said, holy smokes, now comes the acid test. If I move Larry Minkoff over by two inches, that focus spot is now going to be in Larry's lung where there's no water and there's no hydrogen to produce the signal. So if this is going to work, when I move Larry over two inches, the signal should go away. And it would establish that we did indeed have a successful focused spot. So I held my breath and we moved Larry over by two inches and the signal went away. And I said, holy smokes, it's actually going to work. And what we then did was we moved Larry successively to 106 different points. And we had the first ever scan of a live human being and the birth of MRI.
and a few years later, we we uh, introduced the first company, commercial company, to manufacture MRI machines. And we ended up in uh, in patent fights with General Electric, Siemens, and everybody else. And thankfully, thankfully, from the Lord's hand, we were able to uh, prevail in those um, patent litigations. Dr. Demadian, that was an absolutely amazing story. It was beautiful to hear how you went through the entire process. There is ups and downs in inventing. It sounds like quite the intensive process. In fact, on page 582 of the Kindle edition of the book Gifted Mind, you're quoted as saying, Sometimes a single thought can make all the difference in the world. One idea, one concept, and like a light bulb being switched on in an instant, everything changes. That best describes how the idea to create a machine to scan the human body came about. So as the MRI's inventor... This is a reiteration of what I said was my favorite gospel message. In Christ I hid all the treasures of new wisdom and knowledge. So if you're seeking and you're interested in getting new scientific wisdom and knowledge, that's where it is. And so it was God. He was guiding the whole process from start to finish. Right. And that, that's, that's why we had the success. Amen. And I have no other explanation. How do I get 30 miles of wire for 10 cents and a dollar? And I couldn't build a magnet for that. I didn't have the money. But I did have 10 cents and a dollar. And so I like how you said that it wasn't just a coincidence. It was an answer to prayer. That's beautiful. It's amazing how God, he can intervene and answer prayers. You know, you know, and I think the other way that I would comment on that is that the explosion of innovation and industrial revolution that gave us the phenomenon of the industrial revolution in the modern day world occurred in the lands that had Jesus. And it didn't occur in China and India where there's no shortage of smart people. It happened in the land that had Jesus the European Christian countries, and, and America. It's almost like as soon as you make Christ your foundation, you'll be able to derive all of the different scientific knowledge from that. As soon as you do, you have access to new and powerful wisdom that the Christian world has demonstrated to the whole world. Amen. And actually, speaking of that kind of creative wisdom... We can move on to the third section of the interview on young earth creation scientists' contribution to different fields of science. In an article called Super Scientists Slam Society's Spiritual Sickness, you're quoted as saying that your greatest scientific discovery was to find that the highest purpose a man can find for his life is to serve the will of God. Dr. Dermadian, with that in mind, May you please tell us what is the relationship between science and faith? Well, I think maybe the best way to answer that, Chris, is that it's the faith that brings you to the power of science. And the Christian nations of the world showed that to everybody. That's where all science came from. Uh, I, one of my favorite quotes is, is Jesus, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And the, the principal power um, that is in control of everything is the power of the truth. And when you have access to the truth because of your commitment to Jesus uh, and the Lord, you have a new level of power that never existed before. It's the power of Jesus' truth. You shall know the truth, Jesus says, and the truth shall make you free. And that's what happened in a Christian world. It was made free because it had, by the de democratic process, the thing that recognizes what does democracy really do? What is its great power? Where you have a democracy and the power is in, the, uh, in a democracy and not in the hands of a ruler. What it does, what democracy does, is give the power to the truth and take the benefit of the extraordinary power 
that you get from the access to the truth. Amen. That's pretty incredible. So it's almost like as soon as you accept that truth of Christ, that what ends up happening is that he gives you access or he frees your mind, as it were, to the different possibilities that science can bring forward to the table? Yeah, and the new knowledge that he, you have suddenly been given access to, which you can't really get to without him. Amen. Now, Dr. Demadian, speaking of faith, there's an organization called BioLogos. They say evolution is not in opposition to God, but a means by which God providentially achieves his purposes. BioLogos criticizes the young earth creationist position, claiming that it's both unbiblical and unscientific, saying, while most Christian scientists today are not young earth creationists, tens of millions of Christians are. In his wide-ranging study of modern America, religion, and science, historian James Gilbert writes prospectively about a fault line between popular and professional science, ready to break open during times of stress in American culture in the 1920s and again in the post-war period. So it sounds like they're saying that young earth creationism is defeated, both biblically and scientifically. So Dr. Demadian, in light of sentiments like these, how can a young earth creationist make valued contributions to the enterprise of science and to the realm of theology? Well, I, my, my um, straightforward answer on that is that the creation scientists are the ones who have access to the truth. And uh, evolution, I refer to as science fiction. And the reason I do that is the scientific evidence for the phenomenon of evolution that you and I both descended from a slime mold is nonsense. If you go through all of the steps that you have to go through for each of the characters of the evolutionary process from a slime mold, ultimately to an ape, and finally from an ape to a human being, the evidence of those transitions is non-existent. And in fact, Darwin, in his uh, famous book, The Origin of Species, con uh, commits and uh, basically says, and I'm quoting him now, there should be innumerable sources of the, inter of the transitional links. Where are they? They don't exist. So to be more specific, we are all under the evolutionary ideology, we're descendants of apes. Well, the apes all have 400 cc's of brain. The human being has 1,200 cc's of brain. Where's the humanoid in between that shows the transition that has 800 cc's of brain? He doesn't exist. And he's referred to uh, by the current day chronology as missing links. Well, since the original evolutionary debate, it's been 159 years. None of the missing links have showed up. It's, it's, it's simply science fiction. There's no other way to get to the reality of what we live today without him, scientifically speaking. That is, and that evolution is just science fiction. There's no evidence for it. And there's all kinds of scientific people now, we call them creation scientists, that are providing limitless amounts of evidence that Evolution is nonsense. That sounds great. And speaking of that evidence, there's an article called The Not-So-Noble Decision, Recognition Denied for Achievement of Great Scientist Raymond Damadian, who's also a creationist. Dr. Carl Weiland wrote, Anti-creationists often try to pretend that there's no prejudice against biblical creation in the world of science, but creationists have long known that things are not like that in the real world. We even have to publish our own peer-reviewed journals. Any paper which does not bow to materialistic axioms on origins has a snowball's chance in a blast furnace of getting published in a secular journal. So Dr. Dermadian, in light of this how can creationists overcome discrimination in the academic community? Well, I, I think that what I find curious, and I've wondered about it for a while, is how in the world did this scientific hypothesis of evolution that had no evidence 
ever get accepted? How could, how could the human world accept something that had no evidence? And the only thing I could come to is they wanted to take, they wanted to eliminate God from their considerations and concerns, and they wanted a materialistic view uh, where they could synthesize it with evolution and eliminate the real originator and escape the restriction of his rules for your behavior. So by just eliminating God as an authority, now, now you, could, uh, you could indulge any lust that you wanted to indulge without any conviction, which puts, uh, another way that I'll say it, uh, puts our country into the precarious state that we're worried about and living through today. We have our country because the founders were profound disciples of the Lord and gave us this thing called America, which from my perspective is a virtual miracle. Uh, I find it just astounding that, that an entity like the United States of America could, but the reason it has, the power it has, it put the truth of the Lord in charge. And that's where its miraculous success originated. And, and people have to recognize that. If they want to lose the power and their nation, they go ahead and reject God. And the next step is, is, is very simple. And it's the same step as all the other democracies in history that collapsed, like ancient Greece, ancient Rome. So as soon as they reject the truth, it sends them on a downward spiral. Is that what you're saying? You said that beautifully, Chris. That's exactly right. As soon as they fail to recognize the truth that is in charge, you see, breakdown. And actually, Dr. Demadian, we've now come to our final question. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. With this in mind, Dr. Demadian, can you please tell our audience how can we make it into the heavenly kingdom? Um, I think the way I would answer that is that you have to recognize the heavenly kingdom first of all and then revere it with all your soul and number number two have over, have overwhelming respect for the god of heaven if you want to go to <laughs> dr demadian thank you very much for your time it was an absolute joy and to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. Demadian's biography, company website, and technical publications from his scientific career in the link in the description. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.